So as Nathan said, we're here to talk about re, uh, release conditions. And I love the, the way Nathan titled it as the right time and place because used well, release conditions can do some really powerful things for us. But used improperly, they can impede student learning. And since we're all here to focus on that student learning point of view, uh, it's really important that we consider what we're doing when we make choices about release conditions. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. So let's start by actually looking at what a release condition is defined as. And this is D2L's um, definition of. So a release conditions allow you to create a custom learning path through the materials in your course. When you attach a release condition to an item, users can't see that item until they meet the associated condition. So that might be they had to get they had to get a passing grade on a quiz before this. It might mean they have to have read something previously. What that condition is isn't specified here, just that there is something that is going to stop the students from from reading that. So if we think about that, we've got that option of creating that custom learning path, which means the student is really going to have some guidance and support as they work through that. But we counter that with the, the, the principles of adult learning that says an adult should be able to choose when and where and how they access information. And by putting release conditions in, we're blocking some of that, that autonomy that an adult learner should have. So we've got a custom path versus autonomy and choice in how and when we learn. Which one of those should we really be, be focusing on? And what we're going to talk about today is how we can kind of balance those two things. So I'm going to put a link in the chat to a mentee poll, and I would like you to Let me grab the right link here. My system is fighting back. It seems to be a day that I've heard a lot of people complaining that their computers are not cooperating. And so there's, there's a question there that asks, when are release conditions appropriate? So if you could think about times that you've had, you've used release conditions, um, and maybe you think they've worked well, maybe you think they haven't worked so well. Uh, and you know, just to add your thoughts, you can add as many things as you'd like, and then we'll take a, a couple of minutes to discuss. Yeah. Uh, and for those that, that haven't uh, ever hands-on, I mean, it was, I know people mentioned that uh, they were curious and, and are new. Um, Think about removing the concept of Econostoga specifically, which you may or may not have experience with. Um, you could answer this question at a much higher level, which would be to say, um, what are things that you might want to control students seeing until blank? Like I would want them to do blank before blank or uh, anything, any variation of that kind of uh, mad lib or whatever. So um, you can think about it that way too, if, if that makes sense. Okay, another minute or so. Okay, so we've got a number of potential applications for release conditions. And what we'll do, and as we go through the next little bit, 
of this this first part of the, the workshop this afternoon I'm going to ask you to think about these and say do these meet the what the evidence says are good and best practices for release of for release conditions so thank you for taking the time to, to put those up and we can come back and revisit these uh, in, in a bit So our goals for today are pretty simple. We're going to review six evidence-informed practices for conditional release of content. We're going to then consider the student's perception of conditional release. And, and as Nathan uh, said before, you're going to get, get a chance to feel what it feels like to be a student in a course with conditional release. And then Nathan's going to take you some through some ways to use conditional release to really support student learning using eConestoga. So let's start by taking a look at those six evidence-informed practices. And these are things that over time uh, folks have, have looked at and said yes or no. Are these, are, these are good ways to use conditional release. And these six stand out as being um, good things to consider as you're planning to or not to use conditional release. So the first is that the conditions for release should be reasonable and realistic. And so that means that it should be the, that passing grade, if, if there's a pass, that condition should be the minimum level of achievement of what is coming before. So it shouldn't be an expectation that a student is going to, to have fully mastered something. It's that there's a, an, a level appropriate um, for moving forward. So first thing, reasonable and realistic conditions. The second is it's best used with activities or assignments that are leading to mastery of that content. So we want to prepare the students for the authentic assessments that are coming forward. Uh, we want to prepare them for those, those course learning outcomes. And we want to make sure that our students have a, a certain level of understanding before we move forward. The third one is that we're, the best place to be using conditional release is when that course content progresses linearly or it's building on, on itself. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the, the student can't move to here unless they have a reasonable understanding of what has come before. So the, the counterpoint to that is that we really shouldn't use conditional release if there is no negative impact at all on students doing things in a different order. So if I read topic E before I read and process the, the things in module A, that, that, and if it doesn't make a difference, then I shouldn't have A as a condition for doing E. The fourth one is probably the most important is that it must be really clearly communicated to the students that release conditions are being used, there needs to be transparency there, and that, this, that it's really important for the students to have a good grasp of topic A before they get to topic B. And that's why these are being used. So it's not just there to, to force them into a certain path, but it's there for a reason, and that reason should be explained to the students. The fifth one is that if you are going to use conditional release, you need to be flexible as the educator. So you need to be prepared to alter and adjust the conditions and deadlines as necessary. Um, because if you're not, you're putting barriers and penalties in, in place for the students. And in many cases, you're demotivating them. And we don't want our students to be demotivated. So if a student comes and says, you know, I had a problem meeting that, you need to be prepared to say, okay, it's really important that you go back and do that, but I will open up this, this condition. So that flexibility is a really important piece. And then finally, it's kind of just an overall general one, but use it cautiously. Um, so it's best used for critical tasks that are absolutely necessary on the path to mastering the content. And kind of the flip side of that is if you use it too much, you're going to decrease the effectiveness and you're going to increase the frustration levels of your students. 
So reasonable and realistic conditions leading to mastery of the content best for, for courses that there is that, that required flow through topics. You've got to be really uh, clear about what's happening and how things are going to work for your students and why you're doing this. Be flexible for them if things are going wrong from their side of, of, of the equation and just be cautious overall about using it, using it well. And then if we think about, so this same group that came up with this list of six practices said, okay, we're now going to see, we're going to use those best practices on a number of students um, in different areas. So in this particular study, they looked at, um, they had 184 students in three different courses and they were elective courses. So the students ranged from uh, first year to fourth year and they were in, <coughs> excuse me, either math or economics, so business related things or, or um, and I don't think it said whether the math was in technological programs or, or business programs. Uh, so they worked with these, these three courses and they found that yes, these practices uh, overall were really supportive of what the intention was of, of release conditions. So the first thing they found is that the students themselves felt that the, the, um, the release conditions helped them to master the course. It helped them to learn more, they felt, and to get higher grades compared to if they had gone through that course without. So the students themselves felt like it helped. It particularly helped. So the, the evidence, the grades, showed that it helped students with lower GPA averages more than it helped students with higher GPA averages. So it helped keep them on track. It helped or them organize themselves. It helped them reflect on what they were learning. Uh, and that showed through in their, in their grades, which is a good thing. And the, the other flip side of that coin is it didn't seem to impede the students at all who were having, who had a high G, GPA. Um, and so they, it didn't affect their engagement. They still did the work that they would have done before. So it didn't kind of interfere with that, that formula that was put in place. What they did see though, is that the effect of the, the release conditions decreased as the GPA increased. So the higher, the, the better performing that student was, the less effective the, the release conditions were. But that overall, they found that, that the release conditions could be used, if effectively, to really support pedagogy, to really support that learning. So if we go back now to the conditions that you identified, so pre and post simulation quizzes, does that meet those requirements? I'll let the person that put that up there think about that. Time constraints, limited submissions, appropriate file types. Is that a good place? Visibility for weekly content. Again, ask that question. Is this a good place based on those six, six uh, best practices? Students reviewing content or practicing before submitting a graded assessment. Uh, assessments that are in a controlled order and scaffolded. Uh, reading instructions before submitting. Um, yes, Chital, I'll go back to that, that in, a, in a second. Um, so discussion board questions released after content presented. Um, if a learning item is only taught asynchronously, the assessment shouldn't be opened until the content has been opened. Um, and only instructors being able to see certain content. So based on enrollment. So those kinds of things, I would ask you to think about those six um, best practices and say, does it meet the six criteria? And if it does, then go for it. If it's questionable, then you might want to reconsider those. So, so Chital was asking about the effect, the decrease, uh, decreased effect with GPA increase. Is that what you were asking about, Chital? Yeah, that was the one. Thank you. Yeah. So, so what they found is that the higher, the better a student was performing. Um, the, the effect of putting those release conditions was really deemed to be unnecessary. 
that the students would have done as well without the release conditions as they would have um, with them. So they had parallel, they had control groups as well who were doing things without release conditions. And so as the GPA got higher, they weren't seeing a difference in those, those students' results. So it, it's kind of an interesting effect. What it was, it was helping the lower GPA students get above, in many cases, that hump they need to get over in, in order to pass the course. But the, the other students, it either didn't impede them or it didn't really matter at all. Did that clarify it a little bit, Chital? That did, and, and that's really helpful to know um, that it didn't um, it didn't hurt them either, is, is what I'm understanding. Is that right, Nancy? Yeah, and I think as long as it's not interfering, as, as long as they don't feel they're being held back, because many of those students are the ones that want to move forward, they want to, to get a good handle on things, and um, as long as it doesn't stop them from doing that, then it's meeting those conditions. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. One of the, I think, really interesting things about this is that how you frame your mind around even the concept of a release condition can really, I think, change sort of both who you think you're targeting with them and, and why. And so, like, I think that it's natural, and, and I, ha having, you know, taught various courses and you put a lot of effort into creating the materials for your course, and you know that it's important for students to see those materials. But I think it's somewhat natural for an instructor to, to think about release conditions, maybe not consciously, but, but somewhat subconsciously as an opportunity to sort of like punish those students who are not, not viewing everything I post for them, you know? And like, you know, as in make it difficult for them to progress unless they're viewing all the pages that I see. But I think that it's important to think about and approach release conditions more from a, a, a truly like, who, how can I uplift the students who, who may be struggling? And the, the point that Nancy made about those lower GPA students that were helped, I think the way that Nancy even framed that takeaway was that it was helping them stay on track. You know what I mean? Helping them understand what needs to be done, right? It's not about trying to, to punish people who don't, you know, maybe weren't necessarily finding what they needed to find on their own or, uh, or not so well organized to, you know, not miss those things, right? And I think I think that'll become more clear as we look at some of the, the technical applications and options of this tool. But just in general, I think it's important to try to frame your mind around supporting, uplifting, and um, yeah, really trying to like, yeah, bring those potentially those students who are struggling up, not necessarily to trying to punish students who are already doing well, but maybe in their own way, like maybe in a slightly less linear path, right? So some super interesting points there. Um, did you want me to start sharing uh, my screen now, Nancy? Is this a good- Actually, Kelly has a question first. Oh, sorry. Oh, the hand up. Yeah, go for it. Good, good eye. It, it isn't really a question. I was just gonna kind of tag on to what Nathan said there. Like my answers were um, not thinking along those lines at all. So like mine was the time constraints and the, so just learning those aspects now is a different really mindset in, yeah. in those release conditions. It's just brought a different way of thinking awesome. about doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. The other interesting thing that we're going to find, and, and I would say even the, the D2L definition that Nancy shared of what is a release condition doesn't actually capture the whole story of how it can be useful for you and how it can actually be used to support student success. One of the actually biggest areas that I'll focus on is not on necessarily preventing student from doing blank. It's actually informing you or the student that they haven't done blank and should do, you know, X or Y or Z, right? Sometimes like th there are communication applications of, of release conditions that are not just strictly blank is blocked until the student does it X or Y or Z. So I think that that helps with that, that mindset and, and Kelly, what you were saying. And, and I think that we'll give you some takeaways from today to really, uh, to, to really tackle that. And ultimately it's about student success. I guess that's, that's kind of what I was trying to say, right? It, it, your entire focus of why these are implemented should be about um, students succeeding. And you, you do, you are, you are the expert in what they should be doing. And in some cases, you are the one who needs to best define a somewhat linear path or 
a particular point of progression, right? Um, and so th this will open up some of those doors too. Okay, so I'm gonna share uh, my screen here. What I'd like you to actually do as well while I'm sharing, if you could switch over into uh, any browser you might have open with, with Econostoga, if you haven't logged in, um, log in with your regular you know, instructor account. Um, but what you'll find is that, wait, am I sharing the screen with uh, EDEVS uh, 0700-22S on it? Yeah, okay, thanks, Nancy. So yeah, what you'll find is that you are enrolled in this section of this course. It should be in your current courses tab just for you know, today or a couple of days, and then we'll move over to past courses. But you are a student in this course. And what I thought would be a, an interesting exercise, a bit of an experience that you wouldn't normally get, is you get to play the role here of student in a course where I've actually defined quite a few release conditions. Um, I've made a pathway that I believe is a good path for my students. Um, there's an asterisk to all of this. I, I'm, <laughs> I've made this um, not intuitive, even though I, I in, uh, have good intentions potentially, right? Um, anywho, <laughs> I know that's kind of spoiling the, the result, but um, you're a student in this course. Okay, so what I'd like for you to do is open up your browser, access this course here. I'll paste the actual link in the Zoom chat as well. So if you, uh, yeah, if you don't see it listed, if you have a lot of tiles or teaching a lot of courses in the summer, um, it's one of those tiles. But uh, if you navigate into this course, now what I am gonna show you as an instructor, and you can maybe imagine that we've just met for the first time, we have a synchronous meeting on Zoom. And I, I taught a lesson at the very end, I said, okay, and by the way, you, know, uh, you should now have access to your Econostoga course. Um, you know, you'll see that there's content here. Uh, there's some stuff in week one. It's very important, uh, you know, before we meet again next week that you uh, do the week one assessment and uh, best of luck, you know, you go figure that out. And, um, and maybe that's, that's all you kind of know, right? So what I'd like for you to do is spend a couple of minutes now. This is perfect because I need to refill my water anyways, I realized, but I'm going to give you like three, four or five minutes now. Um, you're a student and those things exist in this course, but I haven't necessarily told you much other than that. Um, go and experience the course. What can you do? What can you not do? Uh, try to act like a student who might have been dropped in a little bit, but uh, you know, um, is intending to do what they need, what they've been told, which is to complete the week one assessment. Uh, so give that a shot. And then I think uh, in about five minutes here, I'm going to regroup. We're going to talk about the experiences that you had. We'll see how far you got, and then we'll. We'll dive in on the other side, on the design side, on the instructor side, and we'll, we'll talk about how all these sorts of things can be done, why they might be done, et cetera. So, all right, 338 is when I am going to regroup. So have fun, see if you can, see if you can uh, complete the week one assessment.
like at least two people, maybe right at the end there, were able to, uh, to actually unlock the, the big chunk of course that was not obviously available to you, uh, including the week one contents. Um, let, me, uh, let me start my share again. Go there. Um, but I don't even know, like, I mean, obviously that was only five minutes. I don't even know if you would have gotten even past the, the content and into the, uh, the actual week one assessment. But let me show you how this course was set up with release conditions. And we'll talk about how, of course, I, I set you up to fail in some ways. I didn't tell you what you needed to do, but why that matters, like why it's very, very important for myself and Nancy to sort of like stress what can happen in a scenario where you set up a bunch of release conditions and are not incredibly specific and explicit with your students in terms of exactly what those conditions are and what is expected of them. Okay, so I'm gonna flip over and become a student here and show you how, how it works, how this course works. Um, but yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll, and then we'll do our, uh, our, our lessons learned at the end. So here I am, I'm a student, I've been dropped into this course, right? And I can see that I have some, some stuff in content here, but not a lot and not the week one material I was told are here uh, and not the week one assessment that I was told I need to complete before we meet again. So what I, I didn't mention, but, but should have if this was a real course was that um, before you can do anything in terms of viewing weekly content, in terms of completing the first assessment, et cetera, I have set it up very well intentioned so that there is an acknowledgement statement of some kind before, like a, like a class contract. I've set this up. This could be, of course, very uh, focused on academic integrity. This might be a general uh, behavioral statement that I, I need my students to agree to before they can do anything else. And I use this powerful feature called release conditions to truly prevent my students from even looking at the weekly content until they've acknowledged this statement that I've given them. So for this, I've leveraged the quizzes tool. And here I am as a student, uh, we can see I've done zero of one attempts. And again, I just wanna, I'm gonna have multiple tabs open here, but this is what my content looks like now, right? And uh, we'll see here as a student that after going into quizzes and acknowledging this particular statement, right? This would say, uh, I agree to academic integrity, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and answering the right answer on this quiz, right? Then and only then, if I click done, and I go back to content and I refresh my content. Now, you know, ta-da, magic. Now I have week one, two, three, four, all the way up to week 13. But I think it's very important to observe this student experience because we often know as instructors setting up some tool what our experience is. And we know generally what we're accomplishing by turning on a feature, by setting up a tool. This is the student experience. And I, I wanna point out, you know, what was missing from this experience. There was nothing in content that said, just so you know, weeks one through 15 will become unlocked when you do X or Y or Z. It didn't say that anywhere. You could have, I could have given you days to look for that. You wouldn't have found it. And even then with perfect knowledge of what I'm expected to do as a student, right? I finally completed that acknowledgement statement. My content was unlocked. Did I get any sort of pop-up or notification or even alert from the system that said, hey, your content is available because you did the right thing? No, it just happened, right? And so for as powerful and as useful and helpful as release conditions can be, what you have to keep in the back of your mind, no matter what your use case is, is that 100% of the student's understanding has to come from you. This system doesn't do that for you. It doesn't tell the student, hey, there's content, but you can't see it and this is why, right? And it doesn't tell them once something magically becomes unlocked that it even exists. There's nothing that draws their attention to it. And so that just, that just falls on you, right? As a part of how you are thinking about using this tool. And ultimately it means that you, you can't and shouldn't do any of this without uh, building all of the communication around it as well. And however, you may end up doing that 
in-person email. It doesn't have to even be in Econestoga, but it needs to be somewhere. So that was step one of this process. But even now, if I go into week one, um, I don't have access to a quiz. My instructor, they told me there was a quiz in week one. Uh, okay, so I don't know, I don't see it. I mean, if I look in quizzes, you know, I've left this all to the last day, I'm a little stressed uh, as a student, right? Nothing here. Well, as it turns out, there is a quiz here. And in fact, there's an assignment here as well. Doesn't say that for me as a student, because as an instructor, I've set up a release condition that says, hey, you can see quiz one or assignment one, but only after you have viewed the presentation that I, I gave you and the video that I've given you, right? Here I am as a student, I'm viewing this page. Nowhere on the page does it say, oh, by the way, you're about to unlock X or Y or Z. But if I view this PowerPoint slide and then I view my, um, my video, right? And I suddenly now go back to content in week one, you know, poof, magic. Now I suddenly have these two new things. I didn't get a pop-up about it. I just had to kind of notice, right? But, you know, and so this is, the main thing that I, I want to stress in terms of, um, uh, of approaching this tool, right, is that you really truly need to build the communication around it too. But I have actually demonstrated one of the ways that you can do that by setting up a release condition on an announcement. This announcement wasn't here when I first entered the course as a student, but now it is. And it, it even says my name. Like this is that pop up that I kind of imagined. But this didn't happen because the system did it. This happened because as an instructor, I made this announcement and I gave it a condition, the same condition that unlocked assignment one and quiz one. But it's a little messaging. It's, it's, the, it's the guided part of this experience, of this on rails that I've imagined, right? And so here it says, oh, okay, cool. If in case I hadn't noticed it before, congratulations, you've successfully viewed all the necessary content for week one. This was only released to students who have viewed both of those two pages that I just showed you. And it says what I should do next. This is kind of where we're starting to imagine uh, a truly guided experience and the communication element, including release conditions on communication um, being, uh, being a big part of this, right? Okay, so here I have uh, unlocked this. And now what it's telling me I need to do, interestingly, in this case, this is just how I've imagined this course. Um, maybe there's even an option in week one. The student can either do the quiz or they can do the assignment, right? So I'll pick either or. I'll do the quiz, I guess, as this particular student. And what I want, what I want to show you, the student side here, is what, what comes next. So we'll say true. Uh, yeah, that seems like it's question one. Submit, right? Done. And uh, the end of the quiz doesn't tell me what's next, but hopefully somewhere else does. And now, because I completed that assessment for week one, uh, I've got another an announcement. Like this is something that my instructor has, has templated for me, right? So now it says, good job, you completed the assessment for week one. So that's nice. I mean, it's confirmed what I've done um, and, and that, that thing I did was on a critical path for my, my personal success, right? So, um, so what would come next here, right? I'm trying to even, even remember at this point. There was that, yeah, okay. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you in terms of like, I, I set up like three or four or five things, all very well intentioned as an instructor, but without telling you, you know, I don't know how many people would have gotten all the way to assignment without clicking around, feeling frustrated, feeling in some ways maybe demotivated, like Nancy was saying, because, you know, I don't even know anymore. I'm not even paying attention to what I'm clicking because I'm just going to keep clicking until something happens. It's not clear to me, right? And I think that's just very important to understand about the student experience. Um, so, just to recap, I mean, in terms of what we saw technically possible, we saw, for instance, it was technically possible to have content not visible until some condition was met. Um, another thing we saw, right, was with communication. We saw um, announcements not available until a particular condition was met. We saw the assessments themselves potentially not being visible in this case unless content was viewed. And we saw that in one of those uh, initial Menti posts, right? And that's, that's very well intentioned as well. I don't want my, my student to fail because I allow them to submit an assignment before I know they've read the instructions. Like we, we know that students will do that. You know, some, some number of students will just see that they can upload a, a document and 
And you just, you already know, because you're gonna have to send them an email and say, hey, no, you missed the point on this and that. Here's the instructions again. You're trying to like smooth that stuff out, right? And that is potentially a use case. You know, if you take a look at, at those points that Nancy made and, and you know, this is supporting their success more than preventing or uh, dissuading them from continuing down their important path and, and at their pace, right? So uh, we saw those things. Um, there's other examples in this course that I wanna show. And so one of them is gonna be based on the discussion tool really quickly here. So um, I did also set up a discussion area and as a student, you know, here I am, I can, uh, I can post you know, something about week two or whatever. Um, again, as a student, I don't see anything here that's identifying that this is necessarily a requirement to do the next thing or that it's being tracked at all. As a student, I just know which tools are open and I can see them and I don't know what I can't see, but that, that's how it goes. I'm gonna start a new thread here. Week two thoughts. Uh, I liked week two. The movie we watched was very informative, right? And I'm going to, I'm gonna post this here. Um, and so what I would ask a couple of you to do, this, this instruction is gonna make no sense. We'll just see how it works out. A few of you, and I don't know how you'll know whether it should be you or not. I, I would like for you to post something to this discussion as well. So anyone who maybe still has the, that e-console the window open and accessible, um, because I want to show you a, a really what I think is one of the best use cases for a release condition based on student activity in a tool like discussions. And we're going to see that it's not even necessarily based on blocking the student at all. It's based on acknowledging and supporting students who may have missed some requirement, but in a way that is us basically reaching out and assisting and not you know, strictly making it uh, unintuitive for how to move forward. So. Um, a couple of you, if you wouldn't mind posting, uh, I'll give you a minute here while I take a sip of water. You can just post anything, smiley face or something. You can start a new thread or you can reply to mine. A couple of you. And if you don't, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to be sending you basically an automatic email either way. But you'll get one email that will either say, congratulations, you did it. Or you'll get an email that says, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like you've, uh, you've posted. Of course, this is all just for practice and for fun. So doesn't really matter which one you get, but it will be based on whether you post it or not. It will be accurate to your student participation. Let's see if I've got anyone else. Yeah, another person. Thank you, Chanel. Thank you, very quick. And Smiley, just like I said, that's perfect. All we need. Let's see if I can get maybe one more, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll show you the communication piece that, that can be very, very useful for both, uh, I think, instructors and students. Fresh. Oh, we have some replies to this. Perfect. Okay. So that, that's plenty. Okay. So what I want to show you, and I'm going to be showing you how to set up release conditions, by the way, but I'm just, again, showing you what's possible here first, right? I'm going to go into a tool called the Intelligent Agents tool. Very cool title of a tool. And what you can see I've done here, oh, I'm in the wrong course. Let me go to this one. Intelligent Agents. Uh, da, da, da. Intelligent Agents. What I've done already in this course, and again, I'll be explaining how this is done. I'm gonna make both these things active, enable. I've set up two automatic emails. Each of these emails is gonna be automatic and I've pre-written the text. You can even use some cool tricks like adding the student's names to the text. And each of these emails is gonna be individually de delivered to the students who qualify. One of these emails is templated to say, great job, you posted into discussion too. And one of these emails is templated to say, hey, looks like you haven't done that thing I needed you to do. And what I can do right now is I can run these so that the system is going to figure out for me which student falls into each of these two categories. And it'll send those emails just the way I've pre-written them, right? Five students have completed it. Excellent, that's most of us actually. So <laughs> thank you for these people and this one was me. Um, you got an email that says, in this case, right, I can confirm you've successfully posted in the week two reflection message board. Keep up the great work. Well, let's see how many people, uh, well, I have a bunch of fake students in this course, but, uh, and then a few of you, I think, were really here as well. Oh, sorry, Nancy, you got one of these, so did Jesslyn. I forgot to filter this down to only students, but that's okay as well. Um, a bunch of people did not post this discussion. Well, guess what? Now they have an email that says, hey, just a quick reminder, 
you didn't post to discussion two, right? This didn't prevent the student from doing anything, but it did remind them that they missed a thing. And this is absolutely using that exact same feature called release conditions, just in the context of communication rather than like a gating or, or a barrier. All right. Um, and then finally, in terms of demonstration on the student side, I want to show you what we talked about. Um, there was there was the, the mention of groups and the setting up group work, but also releasing the appropriate document to only the members of a group. That's something that I've done in this sample course as well. Um, if I go in here as a student, I'm still a, no, I'm not, right now I'm an instructor, but I can see that I set up three groups and I set it so it was random. Each of you are in one of these groups, group one or group two or group three. And there's an assignment folder so they can submit together. But I also wanted to provide maybe a different case study document to each of these groups. And I can do that because I went into content as an instructor. I created a module called group project data. And then I uploaded three different versions of the assignment document, a different case study for group one and group two and group three. Well, for whatever, you know, for academic integrity or so that I don't have to keep, you know, switching this every semester or whatever, I wanted, you know, only the group to see their topic or their case study, right? And I was able to accomplish that because one of the release conditions that I can use is based on group enrollment. So how it gets unlocked is not even based on the activity of the student. It's just based on the status of the student. Are you a member of group one? If so, you get this document. You don't get this one or this one. You don't even see it. You don't even know that it exists because all you see is what you, you get, right? And that's going to be true here too if I go in and I eventually find the right tab for the student again. Here I am as a student again, right? And, and if I go into that same group data folder, I only see group one. I'm in group one, that's it, right? So um, not only can this make it so that, again, you have maybe the appropriate group document for each group, I could have in theory, right, set up these groups and I could have made it uh, not named group one, group two, group three. I could have just called it uh, assignment data, right? And then I could put some number of random students in each one and the students don't see what they don't, what they don't see, right? And they don't know that something that they can't see exists. So you don't even necessarily have to tell the student that they get a different version of the document, right? And then you have 10 different versions. You might have 10 different groups here, but they're all just called assignment one document, right? But each of the members of group one get a slightly different Excel sheet or something. And I can do that with release conditions, right? And not have to worry about emailing certain students a certain version or, or anything like that, right? So some very interesting applications for um, groups and release condition. And that extends out. And one of the, the coolest things I think about release conditions is that if you've conceived of some condition in one tool, you can very often apply that same condition in a different tool to support it or to complement it. In this particular case, if I go down to the calendar, each of these different groups, group one, group two, group three, has a different time for their presentation. I want to support my students. I want to put this in their calendar so they don't miss this, right? Well, when you actually create a group, a calendar item, one of the things that you can do is you can actually limit who sees the item by group. And although this one's not labeled release condition, that's effectively what this is, right? Um, and so it, it's kind of the same thing. Like I can support groups because of the fact that they, you know, the system knows who, uh, who all the members are. And that can be true for a calendar. It could be true for an announcement. I could set up an announcement that only the members of group one see, um, even if they don't know it, right? So uh, that's kind of the, the, the student side. And what I'd like to do is go through um, a, a, basically the same course that I just showed you, <clears throat> but with no conditions applied yet. And just talk about how, as an instructor, it is possible for you to set these things up, right? Remember, one of the very first things you would have experienced or that I, I imagined for the student experience was that sometimes content might be blocked based on something, right? And academic, academic integrity is very important. And I'm not um, strictly coming down on the side of the fence that says, well, you know, 
yeah, it's important, but you should just never ever block important content. Um, I think it's debatable, right? But I think that um, there's cases where you'll feel comfortable with it and how you would do that, right? Is you would go in, whether it's a particular folder or whether it's a particular page, you can basically uh, navigate in through content. And just below the title of this folder, you'll see that there's an, an area where it says add dates and restrictions. I actually have to click on that and then it kind of expands. And this is where you would actually see in the content tool, how you can add a particular release condition. There's two options, there's create and browse. You can try browse, but if it's a brand new course or if it's a course where you've never used release conditions, nothing exists here yet. But as we start to use them in other places, you know, this is where we can reuse them a lot more quickly. I haven't set up anything in this course yet. So uh, what we would end up doing instead is going to create. So I would go to create, and this is where for the first time, I mean, we've been talking about release conditions in, in one way or another for like an hour now, right? But this is where for the first time you'll actually see like the full list of possibilities. Just about any tool that a student might interact with and some where they don't interact, but they have a status like their, like their group enrollment or a class list enrollment. Just about any of these things can be used as the condition for something else, whether it's unlocked or whether it's an email or whether it's an announcement or whether it's um, you know, a tool, an assessment or whatever. So you know, scrolling, scrolling a little more slowly, we can see that assignments can be used here. But where this gets especially useful, right, especially when it comes to communication, is that you can have it be locked or unlocked based on a student doing a thing or not doing a thing. And this is where, especially for communication, you want to be able to target those students who have not done the thing, because that's who you want to reach out to. That's who you want to support. So things like assignments, the checklist tool, um, it's like the checklist tool by nature is like an honor system checklist, but you can certainly have things unlocked based on a student self-identifying as complete on a thing, right? But class list, this is where we would find group enrollment, right? If you actually have a merged, a merged course where you've got a section two and a section four, you could actually split your communication or split your content based on which of the two sections a student is in using release conditions. Competencies we can skip, I mean, that's almost never used, but content, I mean, is a big one. Did they view a certain content page or did they not view a content page? Discussions, have they posted or not? This is how I created that intelligent agent release condition. One of the messages had a, 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 a yes, they did post. One of them had, no, they didn't post. And that's how you qualify it. Great items. Not only um, is there a value potentially, but what is the score? Is it a over or less than a certain amount? We can potentially be targeting students who we know have performed poorly, right? To support them, to provide extra content or a suggestion of extra help, right? Because it's not always about only content being released. Sometimes it's about communication. And so this could just be as simple as sending an announcement, offering an extra help Zoom session, but only to students who got less than 50% on the most recent assessment. And I can pick which assessment that is. And I can make multiple announcements throughout the term based on the most recent thing every time, right? That's based on grades. Similarly, based on a quiz, especially if it's auto-graded. And then survey, again, not, not the most popular tool, but the option exists. So just to recreate what I had demonstrated earlier, if I was setting up a content lock based on the academic integrity statement or acknowledgement, I set that up in the quiz tool. So the condition on this week one module would be based on either completing, but in this case, the answer mattered. So we'll say score on the quiz. Which quiz, right? So you can see building these conditions is often kind of a two-step thing. You pick the type of condition, and then it searches your course for which quizzes really exist. And then you pick the exact quiz. And then I'm going to see, once I pick the acknowledgment quiz, I can decide whether they had to get exactly equal to 100 or whether it was greater than 90 or whether it was less than 50, right? Or less than or equal to. So um, between, not between, not equal to. Um, so lots and lots of configuration here, right? But if I say create now and I click update, this is how as an instructor, I can see that there is a condition applied here, but that's it, right? Student sees nothing at this point, student just wouldn't see week one period until they did the thing. 
And so just setting up these conditions and expecting students to figure out, um, absolutely not what I would hope anyone would do once they realize, because you just don't know. Sometimes you don't know what students see or don't, right? And you might expect the system to do a little bit more guiding because you've defined this and the system knows what the condition is, but, um, but it just doesn't, right? Um, so, and then, then we had another set of conditions based on, for instance, the quiz, right? So after the student unlocked week one, um, we went into, I went into the quiz itself, which I can show you here, we'll go to quizzes in this case. And in my example, I made it so that you could not do quiz one until you viewed both of those pages in week one, right? Let me show you how I would do that. I would edit this quiz and I would go to restrictions. And if we scroll down, so uh, halfway down this rest uh, restrictions tab, and you might have been on this page a hundred times, you know, editing your quizzes because you're always typically setting dates. You might be double checking the, the length of time, et cetera. Well, kind of nestled on the middle of this page, pretty easy to miss. You have this option for release conditions. And as we know now, that controls complete visibility and access to this tool. And so what I can do is, again, if I had some already, I could use them, but uh, I don't. So we'll say create and attach. This is where we're working in the other direction. Now they can't do this until content has been viewed. So we can see here, there's an option for that, visited content topic, multi-stage. Now that I've said I know what type of condition, I would now have to go and find that individual page. And you can see, you know, my table of contents is a little long, but here it is under week one, lecture presentation week one, and I say create. This is the, the example that I set up specifically because sometimes you'll have multiple items that you expect to be completed. And I wanted to at least demonstrate, you know, within this framework of release conditions, how that's done. Because now that I've added one page, that's only one of two pages, right? I still have the ability to now say, create and attach again. Create and attach. And now we go down to content, view content, select the page. But notice now I'm going to pick the other week one page, this Laura Mipson video. And I click create. And now notice what's happened. It's just added it to the list. There's not going to be a limit to this list. But keep in mind, like, based on everything we've already said and all the cautionary statements we've made, the more complicated you make this set of conditions, the more difficult it's going to be to communicate that to your student and troubleshoot that for your student. And the other thing that I'll mention, and this was really important that Nancy brought up, I mean, something that you need to acknowledge when you, you just opt into using any of these is that you're going to have a student students who hit a wall, don't understand, even if you posted that announcement, you sent them an email, they don't know what they don't know and they, maybe they don't read it all. Unfortunately, you can't turn off a release condition for an individual student, right? And that's unfortunate. In a perfect world, like the way that Nancy described it, we would be able to accommodate in a very direct way with these release conditions. You'd be able to go in and say, okay, well, for student, uh, for student two, you know, I just got an email from them, they're struggling. I know they didn't view the page, but the quiz is today. I'm gonna to turn it off for them. And unfortunately you can't do that. When you turn on release conditions, it's one and all. And there's no way to do your sort of special access, which you can do for other settings, right? Which would override it for an individual. It just doesn't exist. And that's the reality here of this tool. And so that's why, again, it's very important to be purposeful in a, in a it, the conditions are realistic, they're achievable, so that if you have a student who's stuck, it is achievable and it is realistic for you to be able to say in an email, oh, this is exactly what you've missed and I believe that you can accomplish that, you know, because it's not unreasonable, right? So, you know, there are two items here and that is possible, you know, and you can, it's possible to have more technically speaking, but the more complicated you make it, the harder time you're gonna have explaining to a student, why is my quiz not showing up? And you have a hard time seeing which, which individual page they might have missed, right? So um, keep those things in mind. So if I say save and close right now, right? We can see there's a new little icon here on quiz one that now has a condition. And if I go back in content and I look at where I had embedded that link in content, I can see the condition here too. But again, that's only me. Student can't see this. If they could, I'd feel a lot better about it, you know? And, and I'd feel like I'm not setting you up to necessarily have to answer student emails all day long because uh, they didn't read the thing or, or, or you never told them because it wasn't automatic. And so it's tricky. So uh, I could do the same thing here for assignment one, but now I can finally show you 
Um, because I'm doing the same conditions for assignment one, remember it was an either or, quiz one or assignment one. When I go and edit assignment and I have the same, it's a different layout, but if I go to availability, under release conditions, add a release condition, these conditions already exist because I just made them for quiz one. So I go to add existing uh, content. I can actually do them both at once here now, right? They visited the lecture and they visited that video. I've already set those up on some other tool. Well, now it's really easy for me to add it to this as well. So I say attach. Remember I have the uh, option here of all or, or any. Uh, actually, I didn't mention that, but I'll mention it now. You have the uh, option for all of these or either of these. This is an and or an or. I'll say and, right? Save and close. Um, if we're looking back at this original course where you were a student, remember not only did I unlock quiz one and assignment one when the content was viewed, but I also posted this announcement like, hey, great job, Nathan, you viewed the content. Now go do the quiz, right? So if I wanted to do that here in this course, and let's just say I already have the, I already have the announcement created, but right now, if I wasn't careful, every student sees this on day one, it makes no sense, right? You need to apply these conditions, these announcements um, before they get posted. Um, and, and so right now, like if I go and attach this, of course, yeah, if it was a real course, it'd be too late. But if I say now, um, okay, this is me creating it and I've, I've used my tricks for first name and all that. Similarly, I can use these existing release conditions because I just used them in the quiz and I just used them again in the, in the assignment, right? Content, content, and in this case, it's all of the above or all of the below, meaning they had to do both. So I click update, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, <coughs> Um, remember then, I, you know, we had our discussion board. The discussion board was just, hey, post here. It was already open, but I wanted to communicate to the students who potentially um, didn't, didn't answer either or, right? So if we take a look at the intelligent agent tool, again, I've already you know, started these, but maybe I don't have the conditions on them yet. Um, let's just, here, you know what? I mean, let's just delete these and um, I'll create one of these from scratch. You'll get a better, a better sense for how to set this tool up that way. So I'll say new agent. This is, remember, this is that automatic email service, but it does use this same exact concept called a release condition. So I'm gonna say discussion to successfully posted, right? I'm just templating this tool right now. And I'll skip by some of these things because all the scheduling we can talk about at the very end, but what's most important here um, is that I'm defining who would get this message. And what I forgot to do and why, like Nancy, you got an email at the same time. Um, you can't even be smart here and you can say, hey, by the way, only students should ever get this. So you're, you're pre-filtering and then it says, okay, well, only the students will be considered for the release condition, right? So let's go to release condition. Again, we have, this is the first time we're doing one based on a discussion. So I'm gonna have to create it. I say create, we choose the type. And here I can see under discussions, um, first of all, this is the one that goes out to the people who did post. So I'm going to use the did post, right? The first option based on my discussion too. And you can be, you know, you have interesting options here. Maybe they had to post three times. Maybe they only had to post once. Maybe they had to start a new thread or maybe they were allowed to reply. It, it really branches like in terms of your ability to tailor these things based on your, your vision of student participation. So we'll say create, posted one time, thread or reply, doesn't matter, right? Um, generally then what you would do is you would say, especially for this one, I don't want the student to keep getting a message about this every week if I schedule it for a week or something, right? So only the first time they qualify and then every student's going to get this message only once. Um, you know, then we do have the ability, if this was something that we wanted to check over the, over a semester, right? We're running once a week to look to see whether they logged into the course or whether they, uh, um, viewed some, you know, viewed content or something, right? Um, then you would set it up. You could say, hey, weekly, every Tuesday, every Friday, uh, at this particular time, I want you, the system, to scan for me. Look at that release condition, send the email, but only to the people that, that qualify. If you have no schedule, you can also run this manually, which is what I did for the sake of the demo earlier. So I, I've actually already done what I needed to do here, um, besides actually composing an email. And, um, I'll do this somewhat quickly, but if you want to learn more about the intelligent agent tool in depth, then um, send me a message. I have like 
I've done this in workshops in the past. I've spent maybe half an hour just on this tool, giving it a, a bit of a more detailed uh, demonstration. Um, but in general, you use these special uh, variables so that uh, only the qualifying students will ever get the message. Um, so it's a bit of programming it, uh, I guess, if, that, if that's the best way to think of it. But um, great job, discussion two. I, I'm writing this because I know that the student has posted or else they, they're not seeing this, right? I can use these cool special uh, special tricks for the first name and stuff. So I can say, and it's why all of you in the message you got from me should have seen your own first name there, right? It very much looks like to your students that you've just gone through the entire class list and like see it, scan to see if they post and then you compose a personalized message to them. Um, so if you do this right, they will feel very supported even if you, you know, weren't doing it hands-on. Great job posting in discussion to see you for more next week. All right, save and close. I would do the very similar thing. I would make another different new agent for the fact that they didn't post. Discussion to did not post. And so we go in and we can say, all right, remember, it's only going to be students. I just forgot to do that before, but uh, it's only going to be students. And then I go to condition and I say, all right, create another new condition based on the discussion tool. This time it's that there are no posts. Only send this to students with no posts. We say week two reflection, and they didn't do either, right? I didn't do this off the fly. Say create, I template my email again, you know, hello, first name. I can see that you did not post in week two discussion. This is important if you need extra assistance, right? You're, you're, this is literally just trying to support them. And I mean, you'd find a nice way to word this. Um, please reach out. Subject, week two discussion, not posted. And there's a special email address, which I always just copy paste because if you type it wrong, the whole tool breaks, unfortunately, I'm not even exaggerating. So say save and close, right? That's all I did to, to send those messages to, to you folks, right? But you could even build it so it runs on a schedule. So I know it's going to check on Friday at noon. Uh, I could have done it so it checked today at you know 3:45, or if I knew when that was going to happen, right? Or you can run it uh, manually, right? So run now. So I'll say run now here. I'm not going to. There's no real students in this one that are posted, but you get the idea. Um, talking about uh, groups. That's the other one that I'll do really quickly here. Um, and then we'll open it up. And if anyone has any kind of like ideas that this has spawned, questions or demonstrations that they want to see, uh, use cases they want to like talk more about, then, then we'll have a few minutes for that for other people that have stuck around. So um, the last one was groups, right? So in general, again, you can set up these groups uh, for any reason. And it could be for actual group work, or it could be like, for instance, if I create a new category here, right? This could be assignment one. <coughs> you know, source document, if that makes sense. And I could say, hey, you know, I'm gonna have 10 different, um, 10 different versions of this spreadsheet that I give my students for assignment one. Well, the first step is just making all these groups, right? So I have, I think I might even have exactly 10 students in this class, but we'll see. I'm just gonna say save, you know, all right. So far I'm making 10 different groups, I'll say, okay. Uh, it's creating them right now. Shouldn't take too long though. Oh, there is, maybe there's 11. So here's the, um, it's randomly put each of my 10 students into 10 different groups, right? So what I uh, demonstrated earlier from the students, uh, student side was that I can have a thing here, and maybe even it's like a subfolder of week one or whatever, right? These are, this is the assignment one document. <clears throat> and let's just say I had, you know, different versions of it. Let me go find some, some files I can share with you. I'll just put four here, but yeah, this would be 10, right? And basically like each of these was a spreadsheet that was slightly different, or each of these is a, a case study that has some different names in it. What I'm showing you now is for academic integrity, but just one way you could use the groups tool. But it's an interesting way because students don't necessarily see what they don't see, right? And so what I would do here, and what, where this is different than the previous example, when I was doing release conditions on the, on the entire week one module, for instance, right? I was clicking up under the, the title of the module 
and saying, all right, will these condition, you know, apply? And now it applies to everything in that folder. But I can do the same thing for individual pages, but I first have to go to the edit properties. So we go here, edit properties. Now I have the option for restrictions. And now I can go in and I can say create. So basically, even though the student doesn't know it, they're only going to get this version, this document, if they're a member of group one. So I would say create based on class list group enrollment, and I define which group, group one. If I wanted, I could make this one in group one and group three and group seven or whatever, right? Like not the students don't know. So I would say update. And now only students who are members of group one see that document. And I would do a similar thing for all these other different versions, right? So we add dates and restrictions, create class list, group enrollment, group two, right? Now only the member of group two will see this particular version of the document. Now, the only other thing you might do if you were gonna like do this exact thing, but you really wanna do it right, um, you wouldn't necessarily want the student to know which group they were in. Like you, don't, you can't prevent the student from going into the groups tool and seeing, oh, I'm a member of this group. So what you might end up doing is just renaming these like to something more generic. The thing that's actually gonna stop you from just having all of these group names be the same name you can always figure out who's in what based on um, based on this. But yeah, it, it gets tricky because then you need to go and set the release conditions, obviously. But um, some combination of these things uh, where you can hide the fact that it's a particular group or not because um, they can't do anything with it other than know that it exists. They don't see any other groups. They don't know who is in other groups. They only know that they're by themselves in a particular one. And that just means they got their version. Um, so final, final um, uh, points where you could potentially apply release conditions that we didn't even cover yet. Um, things like the awards tool. Um, if you're not familiar with the awards tool, in this tool you can set up either certificates or, or like badges, right? I could actually create a brand new badge here that says, uh, let's add an award, right? We'll go and we'll say create one. This is called the discussion master. And you use the exact same set of release conditions, but in this case, Again, it's not preventing students from doing anything. It's just rewarding students and acknowledging that they have done a thing, right? So, so it's positive. It's gonna maybe help motivate those that it helps. Others, like, you know, we, we maybe saw it with Nancy, that are high performers anyways. They say, okay, cool, all right, great, but I already know what I'm doing, right? And they'll ignore it. I don't think it's gonna hurt them. So we say uh, discussion master, right? And I can do things like uh, choose this. So um, posted three times in the discussion. Uh, for week two or whatever, right? Um, you actually get to pick like an icon for this. Well, I don't have I don't have one, so we'll pick one. This person's got a little speech bubble, right? So, but it's two steps to make an award. The first step is to create it and then also like give it a title, give it a description. Then you go to edit properties, and guess what? We have a, a feature here called exactly release conditions. And when I say create, it's the exact same list that we saw in content, in quizzes, in announcements, in intelligent agents, right? This one's just to reward students. So I would go back to maybe, hey, did you post in the discussion? But this time I'm gonna say uh, they posted three times. This is the stretch goal, right? Like, I mean, the communication just said, hey, great, you did the minimum. This is now the stretch goal. We've got, hey, did you post three times? Well, if you post three times, you get a badge. Does the badge mean anything? No, but you, you got it and it's colorful, right? So. If I say create and save, that's kind of a fun, a fun use for release conditions that again, in no way blocks progress and no way blocks any kind of nonlinear paths. So um, some, some cool potential there. All right, last few minutes, what do you all want to talk about? Or do you have questions? Or was anything not clear about that the how to or, or the why? You know, Nancy's still here and we can chat about either. Or if you've got one in, in, your, in your mind where you're like, okay, I saw some examples. I'm picturing exactly this, you know? I could either demonstrate that or, or tell you how you might do it. So we got Scott with a hand up, fire away. Yeah, I've just got a question about how release conditions interact with your new dynamic instructional plan as well as the yeah. calendar, because yeah. I'm a little concerned. I, I love the idea for content and for the group and you know having specific documents for different groups. I'm worried about hiding assessments and that the student has no idea on day one yeah. what the assessments are, when they are, when they're due, and all those due dates, because I know that students are supposed to have all that information yeah. at the and very that, beginning of the course. And, and unfortunately, 
you're, you're asking the right question. And I think your instincts are also correct. Um, the way that these things interact with the instructional plan is they hide them. They hide them in, in their entirety from students. The way the dynamic instructional plan works is it basically, it basically says, hey, who are you? Oh, you're student one. What can student one see in this course? And it finds all the things that student one can see and it slots them into the appropriate weeks. As soon as you've applied a release condition to content item one, right? Then suddenly content item one is no longer visible. Now, we spent extra time developing some workarounds specifically for assignments and quizzes. So actually, if you put a release condition on an assignment or a quiz and a student can't see it in that tool, it'll still show up in the appropriate week in the instructional plan. Yeah, because well, it, it, it didn't in the sample one you had, it showed up in the breakdown of grades for the course, but under week one, it didn't show up as a, as an activity, which is why I asked. Yeah. I didn't put any, I didn't put any dates on it. Like, I don't think I oh, okay. put dates. I think That's... it was just missing dates period. Okay. But I think if it had a date, it would show up. Um, but like, it's not going to be an active link in week one for that student, right? It's just going to literally yep. list the day and the percentage. But, yep. but the, but assignments and quizzes are the only things that we've done that extra work for. So it means that if you have discussions that are hidden, they're, they're hidden. If you have content that's hidden, it's hidden. So it's a little bit hit and miss right now. Those are things we want to improve, but um, yeah, it's kind of like 50, 50, but we knew that it would be important to never, yeah, to not permanently hide quizzes and assignments because it needs to be in that document, even if it's not accessible yet. Yeah, because it you really don't want a release condition for that. You almost want a start condition. Yeah, you, you can't start it until you've completed certain things, rather than you just can't see it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Unfortunately, the release condition is what it is. It's an on-off switch, and if it had more nuance, like in a perfect world, I would design it that way for sure. Where it's like there's levels of release, right, of uh, view versus uh, participate versus something else, right? So, um, you know, super good question there. Yeah. And is that the new official layout for the intelligent agent or has that been around for a bit? Yeah, that, okay. that's, within, that's within the last month because I'm sure okay. I looked at it last month and it wasn't that. No, because you, well, you could never choose the time. You yeah, could say yeah, daily yeah. and it would be the 3 or 4 p.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was always either 3 or 4 depending on daylight savings time. Yeah. And, and this surprised me as I was preparing for this. I looked at this earlier this week and it was the first time I saw it. So you haven't missed it for long. Okay. Um, definitely new this. And then, yeah, what, what Scott's referring to is this. This never existed before. Yeah. Um, it used to always be the same time every day, which you could live with, or you could run it manually. But uh, that's obviously was a requested feature, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that is just new. Yeah, kind of cool. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, all right. Um, I'm going to stop the recording just so that there's not too much extra time at the end if, if uh, there aren't anything, that, anything that's specific here. But I'll, I will hang around in case anyone else wants to chat. I'll be posting this, like I said, um, 